It's good to see you all tonight. I tend a little sparse here, but uh, I think we're going to skip over the song part of the service tonight, and we'll go right into the message. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your power, for your grace, for creating man in the image of God, for making of all nations of one blood. Father, we pray for your blessings on the message tonight. We pray that as the Word of God goes forth, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And so, Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We pray that you will bless us, that you will guide us, that you will direct us, that your word would go forth with clarity and power, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And so, Father, we commit this to you, and pray for your blessings on the word of God tonight as it goes forth, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please take them and turn to Acts chapter 17. Tonight, the Lord willing, we're going to be looking at verses 26 and 27. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might find after him, feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Those are the two key verses that we want to look at tonight. Very important because we find a number of uh, truths that the Apostle Paul states here that perhaps we don't normally think about. The phrase that we want to look at tonight is that first phrase in verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. The second is a very important statement also, and hath determined the times before appointed that is, when they're going to live, so not only who is going to live, but when they are going to live, and where they are going to live. That's the last phrase, and the bounds of their habitation. And then it tells us why God does it. Verse 27 says that they should seek the Lord. God made all nations of one blood. He determined the times of their existence, and he determined their location for the specific purpose of giving them the opportunity that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And we'll be looking at the later verses where he tells us more things about the purposes of God uh, as laid out in these three key factors in verse 27. For in him, this is verse 28, we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. It's going to be a key message. We hope that you're able to be here for that. How is it possible that we are the offspring of God? How does that tie into pagan poetry, as also certain of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring? And then verse 29, Paul makes his application, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. doesn't matter who you are, what your time is, where are the bounds of your habitation. God put all those things together so that there would come a time when you have the opportunity to repent and to turn to Christ because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. Rather interesting to see how this parallels with the message that we gave this morning, with the first plague of blood, where Moses strikes the river, it turns to blood, and all the waters of the Nile, all the way to the headwaters, all over the land of Egypt, all of it turns to blood, including the water that's in the vessels, wooden vessels and stone vessels, it all turned to blood. It was judgment, and we saw how that tied in with the book of Revelation, and how blood seven times is used in terms of the revelational judgment, seven different places in the book of Revelation where blood speaks of the judgment that God sends on the earth. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But as we looked at the speech that Paul is giving here on the Areopagus, that is Mars Hill, uh, in verse 9, and uh, verse 19, excuse me, and in verse 22, where it tells us that 
uh, the Areopagus is in fact Mars Hill, we noted a number of things. We noted that there is a spiritual warfare in which we are engaged. And so Paul is engaging in spiritual warfare as we are here in Acts chapter 17. Spiritual warfare against the pantheon of the Greek gods was doing what Moses was doing in Acts chapter 7 as he challenged the gods of Egypt. We saw there was a very interesting and uncanny difference though that Exodus 7, God and Pharaoh both hardened Pharaoh's heart and there were no converts, but in Acts 17 we discovered that although some of them mocked, others were curious and some of them were irresistibly drawn to salvation. In Exodus 7, God's purpose was to judge Pharaoh and Egypt. They'd already had the truth for 400 years, and they'd rejected it. In Acts 17, God's purpose was to open the door for the gospel at the cultural, educational, artistic, and legal and economic center of the Greek-speaking world, Athens, the capital of Greece. Although the armies of Rome had conquered Greece, the language, culture, and philosophy of Greece had conquered Rome. And here we find Paul presenting the gospel to the intelligentsia of the capital. That's where God brought Paul, this highly trained intellectual Jew, to preach the gospel to Gentiles. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was engaged in spiritual warfare at the very heart of the Greek culture. And we're going to see that you and I are engaged in a spiritual warfare here at the heart of the Western culture, which is the United States of America. And we're involved in a spiritual warfare on a very basic level, just like Paul was here in Acts chapter 17. We'll see more about that tonight as we see what he says about a very up-to-date scientific truth concerning the one blood which runs through the veins of every human being alive on planet Earth today. It's a spiritual warfare that deals with one of the critical issues of our culture, a critical issue which is turning aside our young people, which is bending their minds, which is leading them into animalistic-like immorality, which is turning them away from the truth of the gospel of Christ, which is giving them no hope and giving them the attitude of it doesn't matter, who cares if I live like an animal, because after all, that's what our modern culture tells these young people. They are only highly evolved animals, and we're on our way to something better, but they're going to die, and they have no hope, they have no purpose, they have no courage to face the future, so they might as well compromise on every issue, because there is no meaning. And that's the culture to which God has sent us, and we're going to learn some tips tonight from what the Apostle Paul says here on Mars Hill that will help us understand that and how to answer the people in the culture around us. The most significant thing that we noted last week was that Paul presented God as the creator. He presented the God who made everything. Paul makes the point that the creator God is the supreme God over all the gods. None of them could exist if there was not a creator. From the Christian perspective, we know that he even created them because they are all demons manifesting their supernatural powers in subordination to his omnipotent power. The Gentiles, in worshiping the pagan gods, are actually, according to Scripture, worshiping demons. And demons are created beings. They are fallen angels who fell with their leader, Lucifer, who now is known as Satan or the devil. The gods of the pagans are all fallen angels. The gods of the pagans are those gods that are at war with the true God. And so we saw that it was appropriate that Mars and Athena were prominent in the location where God chose to do battle because those were the gods and goddess of war. God did battle on their home turf. God is not afraid of his crea uh, creatures, nor is he afraid of his creation. Also, to the Greeks, the true God was an unknown God. As mankind has over the centuries followed demonic deception in Genesis 6 before the flood and Nimrod in Genesis 10 after the flood at the Tower of Babel, man very soon had only dim memories of the truth. Even so, the Greeks had followed the gods of their own hands and had lost the knowledge of the true God. Paul wrote, or Paul spoke, and it was written in Acts, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. But as we saw last week, according to Paul in Romans chapters 1 through 3, they were all still accountable to God because of the light of creation. So the very first argument that Paul makes in his magnificent epistle to the Romans is the argument from creation. Paul starts at creation. The presentation of the gospel 
as we try to reach into a pagan culture, needs to knock down all the false gods of our age. And evolution is one of those. An evolution that requires no god, that starts with a primordial soup of some kind of something in a little nug nugget in the middle of the universe that explodes by itself. And then all you see comes from that. There is a creation. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. <coughs> Men are without excuse because they have had the light of creation. They've turned their backs on it, but indeed they have it. They also have a conscience. Paul explains that in Romans chapter 2. We looked at that last week. So creation is the first and foremost bulwark against the false gods of this world. That is where the spiritual warfare is raging today in the culture around us. We need to be armed, and we need to be arming our children and our grandchildren with the evidence and the arguments for the truth of creation. The devil knows that's the battlefield of this time. Paul grabbed in his presentation to the cultural intellectuals of his day in the doctrine of creation. God that made the world and all things therein, Acts 17, 24. Seeing he is the Lord of heaven and earth, neither dwelleth in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. We saw that Paul was not ashamed to state the biblical truth that God is the sovereign over all of the pagan gods. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. Even though people hate the doctrine, doctrine of the sovereignty of God, it is clearly stated in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The third thing we noted last week was that Paul expressed the transcendence of God. God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And that, of course, was a direct insult, as we pointed out, to the most beautiful temple in the world, world that they could see just a few hundred yards away from where they were standing when Paul gave his speech. The fourth thing we noted was that Paul not only puts God as distinct from his creation, but he puts God as independent from his creation. God does not depend on us. He doesn't need us like the Greek gods needed the sacrifices to eat. Otherwise, they would do miserable things to the people who were supposed to be worshipping them. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. And then finally, we noticed something that ties us back into our message this morning. We notice that God is the source of life, and by extension, therefore, everything that lives and everything that we have. Since it all goes back to living things who copy their creator in creativity by making all the things that can be seen there from the top of Mars Hill. Only the creator can give life. It doesn't happen by chance. Paul says, seeing he giveth life to all, uh, giveth to all life and breath and all things. Paul probably waving his hand over the city of Athens as he pronounced those words. Now that brings us to tonight, one blood. This morning, we saw the reasons that the first plague that God sent on Egypt was the plague of blood. We saw four reasons given in scripture why the plague of blood was the very first plague and why it had to be the first plague. First, we saw that the Nile was one of the principal gods of Egypt because it was worshiped as the source of life. Remember what Paul said in Acts 17? That God is the source of life. God is the one who gives to all life and breath and all things. Those are the words of Paul. That reminds us in a very interesting parallel with what we saw this morning in the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 7. God is the source of life. The reason that the water was turned to blood in that first miracle, that first plague, was because God was pointing to himself as the creator and ultimate and only source of life. It was God who created life, not some inanimate sources or created things. We saw that had practical application for us today. Life did not spontaneously arrive in a primordial soup of chemicals composed of hydrogen and oxygen, as posited by some evolutionists. The very first plague was designed to establish God as the creator of life. God always goes back to his glory as creator first before moving on, and that's precisely what we see Paul doing in his sermon in Acts chapter 17 on Mars Hill. We saw that last week when we studied Paul's sermon before in the earlier part of this passage that we're looking at this evening. Tonight we're going to see that Paul points to man as the capstone of God's creation by focusing on that one key scientific fact 
that God has made of one blood all nations. The second thing we saw this morning, the second reason that blood was the first plague was also closely related to the first reason. The Bible tells us that the physical location in which he has put life is in the blood. But unless God puts it into the blood and sustains it in the blood, blood by itself does not have life. It rots. The third reason we saw that the plague of blood was first was also stated in Leviticus 17, where it tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood, is that there must be blood for an atonement for sin. In verse 11 it said, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Blood, the vessel of life, is required to make atonement for sin. And as we noted this morning, all the rotting blood of the Nile could never atone for sin. Dead blood, dead infected blood can never make an atonement for the soul. Only pure living blood can do that. Pharaoh was worshipping the Nile as a source of life, but Pharaoh's source of life was dead. It was a false hope. It was a stinking, rotting, undrinkable river filled with death. It brought death to the fish that were in it. It could not be drunk to give life. Only the blood of Christ is a pure river that can give life and make an atonement for our souls and our consciences. We further saw that the blood sacrifice had to be offered by a qualified priest, not by a pagan priest or a magician. Fourth, we saw that the plague of blood was a portent of future judgment on the world, and we saw a striking parallel with the book of Revelation, where blood is mentioned 17 times, and seven of those times, just like there are seven days of plagues of blood from Moses, it related to specific judgment. Blood related to specific judgment. And Paul talks about that in Acts chapter 17. As he speaks of Jesus Christ rising from the dead, he says, Jesus is the one who's been appointed to judge all men. You're all of one blood, no matter what nation you come from. Jesus Christ, truly human, truly God, raised from the dead, is therefore the one who will judge you. You're all of one blood. You all go back to one source. You go back to the God who gave you life. You've rejected the true God, and God is going to judge you someday by Jesus Christ. It's uncanny how we see the parallel. Not uncanny, it's biblical inspiration how we see the parallel with what was happening in Exodus chapter 7 as God sent his judgment upon the children of the, the Egyptians in the book of Exodus. That's what ties us in with Paul's statement tonight. Remember, life does not exist just because there is blood. That's why God, under the law, prohibited Israel from eating blood like the pagans did. That prohibition was a reminder to Israel of the first plague, which had redeemed them. We saw the passages that pointed us back to that this morning. We looked at Leviticus 17, verses 10 through 14, where it specifically stated that the life of the flesh was in the blood. Now I want to show you another passage that's even earlier than that. Tonight we want to look at the book of Genesis. That fact about the life being in the blood is actually given earlier in the book of Genesis. I want to talk about it tonight because it gives a further connection to the creation of man. To the creation of man as distinct from the animals, not proceeding from the animals as a higher form of animal life, but created distinctly and separately from all the animals, even those that have blood, even those which are called primates, like the apes. Man was created distinct, not as an extension of animal life. Genesis, I want to talk about it tonight because it gives us a connection to man as distinct from all other so-called animal life. That's Paul's point in Acts 17, where men, not animals, are held accountable for their sins. Here's what we read in Genesis chapter 9, immediately after the flood. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. American Christians have forgot that. That's a command that has never been rescinded, has never been countermanded, uh, is not part of the law. It's much pre prior to the law. It's a command that God gave and restated on multiple occasions in the scripture. It's an expectation that God has of those who are his children. Imagine what America would be like tonight if true Bible-believing Christians had never practiced birth control and had trained all their children in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Instead, what we see is our country being flooded with cultures and peoples who do not believe in the true God and who are having many wives and many children and propagating the planet with their false doctrines, their murderous doctrines. 
What would it have been like if Bible-believing Christians had chosen to follow that command? You know, God opens and closes the womb. It's very clear in Scripture. God is the one who opens and closes the womb. And how many people among those who call themselves Bible-believing Christians have decided they're going to interfere with what God is doing? And so they've decided not to have children or only to have 1.8 children to keep the balance of the population exactly stable so that we don't get overpopulated, which is a, a very hoax kind of an idea. Does not fit in with scripture. Back to the subject. Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Before this, men were vegetarian. After the flood, God gave them animals to eat. It's not wrong to kill animals. It's not wrong to eat animals. Or, uh, in contrast, to those who are the so-called animal rights types that think that it's murder to kill an animal. There was a funny bumper sticker I saw some time ago. It said, if we're not supposed to eat animals, then how come they're made out of meat? Genesis tells us that we have the right to eat animals. There were certain unclean animals under the law, but today there are no unclean animals. You can eat all the things that were forbidden under the law because the Apostle Paul makes that very clear in the New Testament. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. We're no longer under those same dietary restrictions of the Old Testament because we live in the age of grace, not the age of the law. But let me get back to our text for tonight. Verse 4, and here is the statement that we see repeated in Leviticus chapter 17, verses 11 and 14. But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require life of man. Verse 6, very important key verse. Not only do we have a restatement of the principle of where life resides, which was verse 4, but now we find the reason for it. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. In other words, there's nothing wrong with capital punishment. In fact, God commands it here. For those who commit murder, God says that man is to be killed. Not to be put in prison, not to be put out on parole after, you know, a little bit of time in prison. God says that for murder, that man should be put to death. For in the image of God made he man. That's the reason that's given in Genesis chapter 9 verse 6. Now, you know, you and I have the vantage point of looking back at the cross. We can look back and we can see some things that they only slightly saw foreshadowed in the Old Testament. As we look back at the cross, we see that true God became true man through the virgin birth. When Jesus took on flesh, it was real flesh. And it was supported like all of us with real human blood. The shedding of human blood through murder or by animal death is a violation of, the, of one of the most important principal aspects of the creation of man. That's what we just saw in Genesis 9-6, because man is made in the image of God. But there's an important difference between all of us and Christ. Because Christ was sinless, his blood was not corruptible like our blood. Did you know that's the reason that our blood decays and why death sets in with us today and why our flesh rots because of the corruption of the blood and the decay of the human system that we find ourselves in, but that all goes back to sin. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It all ties together here, but it goes back to creation and the fall. 
But the blood of Christ is different. It wasn't corruptible. That's clearly stated in the Psalms, which is then quoted in the New Testament. Let me, let me give you that passage. That's Psalm chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. Here is prophetically speaking of the coming Messiah, and it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Now Jesus was dead and in the tomb three days and three nights. We know that normally by that time he would have begun to rot and to stink. Now that was the objection that Martha made when Jesus told them to take away the stone from Lazarus's grave. That was four days there. But Jesus said, did I not say to you that if you would believe you'd see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. And instead of smelling rot and death and corruption, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And Lazarus did come forth. He was still bound hand and foot with his grave clothes, but he walked out of that tomb. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Martha knew what was happening to Lazarus, but the scriptures prophesied that it wouldn't happen to Jesus. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now you know when we get to the New Testament, both Paul and Peter make a great point of that prophecy on repeated occasions when they're presenting the superiority and the uniqueness of Christ. The first place we find it quoted is in Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. That is foundational to the opening of the church age. And in that message on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, standing in the courtyard of the men, where Peter stands up and says, you men of Israel, this is nothing you know, that you shouldn't expect here. Joel prophesied it in Joel chapter 2. And he goes on and he preaches a sermon about the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and following. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now listen to the next two verses. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him. And he begins to quote Psalm 16. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Now here's our key verse. This is the one we just read a moment ago. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Peter clearly points to Jesus as the fulfillment of that prophecy, and that Jesus... When he died, though he shed his blood, his blood did not corrupt. His body did not rot. He lay in the tomb because he was untouched by sin. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree, but he himself was sinless. He knew no sin. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Now David's the one who gave that prophecy, remember? He said, for David spoke concerning him. That's verse 25. Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. What a contrast. David, even great David, was a sinner. And so when he died, his blood decayed, and David rotted away. That's the point that Peter is making here. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Now here Peter quotes those two key verses again. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Rather important and significant point, that although Jesus is truly human, as well as being God, he was clearly sinless, and that is proved by the fact that when he died, his blood did not decay, and his flesh did not rot. 
Paul in Acts 13 quotes that same passage from Psalm 16 when he's preaching in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia. Acts chapter 13 beginning in verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. And then verse 35, he quotes Psalm 16. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And then he contrasts him with David, just like Peter did. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Again, that contrast with David who died and rotted away. And then in verse 37, which is the clincher, But he whom God raised up again saw no corruption. What a difference between those of us who are born dead in trespasses and sins and Jesus Christ who, the virgin, who through the virgin birth did not inherit the old sin nature. Jesus Christ, who when he died, his blood did not decay. When he died, his body did not rot. Verse 37 again, But he whom God raised the dead again saw no corruption. Now let's pause and think about that for a moment. The rest of humanity will also be raised from the dead. But we are raised after going through the state of corruption, even including the rich people. And by the way, that's uh, important to note at this point. And, and the scripture talks about the rich who, are, who think they can escape it. And I'll read that to you in just a moment. You know, there, there is a process today which people are spending millions of dollars on called cryogenics. And cryogenics is not the answer. That's where they quick freeze a body at death in hope that future science will somehow be able to restore life and cure them of whatever disease they've got. It's not the answer, folks, because they already have the death principle at work in them. What they need is not science to raise them up and fix them. What they needed before death was Christ, who's the only one who can change this vile body into a body like unto his incorruptible body. That's 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll look at also in a moment. So the answer is not cryogenics. Listen to Psalm 90, 49, verse 6. They that trust in their wealth, here are all the rich people going out there and getting themselves quick frozen after they die, and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever that he should still live forever and not see corruption? It won't work, folks. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. To those guys who are out there hawking their, wor their wares, that, hey, when you die, we'll be right there, we'll take your body, drop it into a, a deep freeze, and you'll be frozen solid instantaneously just like that in liquid nitrogen, and, and, uh, and you'll be just like those, those woolly mammoths that they still find in Siberia, where when they dig them up, they can still eat them today. You want a woolly mammoth steak? Well, when they thaw out, you can cut a steak out and eat them. Folks, that's not going to happen with us. We see the truth that we also will all rot as the blood decays, also in the New Testament, in that great resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 and verse 50. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption, that's the flesh and the blood, inherit incorruption. For there's no longer any death or decay or spoilage or the rotting or the disintegration of the blood system. He said, that's the state of humanity because of the sin of Adam. It brings us back to creation. That's the sin of Adam in us. That is part of the great curse that was placed on all of creation because of the sin of man. That means that animals are also under the curse because they were under the hand of Adam because of Adam's sin. It goes back to Genesis, friends. Genesis is the only foundation. Genesis is the only explanation why things happen the way that they happen. 
And that's what we see here tonight as we look at Acts chapter 17. That's the foundation for Paul's statement in Acts 17 as he points back to the Creator God, which he's just done in the preceding verse that we looked at last week. He's talked about God who made all things, and now he brings it down to man. First, he's the creator of all things, and then in our text tonight, he is the creator of man, and one of the distinct characteristics of the physical body of man is his blood. Now, put that in the context of who Paul was. Very interesting. God had to radically revolutionize the mind of the Apostle Paul for him to be able to make that statement to this motley group of Greeks on Mars Hill. Put it in the context of this guy who was a super holy, super ancestor conscious, super I am proud of my bloodline from the tribe of Benjamin, Jew, preaching to a mixed bag of Greeks. Paul definitely knew his bloodline. The Jews considered themselves better than the Gentiles. The Jews considered themselves to be the pure race. They were the ones who were descended from Abraham. They were the ones who were chosen by God. They were the ones who had the covenants of God. They didn't mix their blood with other nations. They didn't drink blood. They were the superior super separatists. But perhaps now you remember the message that I brought in the morning worship service about a month ago concerning the real humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, several messages on that. And we noticed at that time that all of us are genetically related to Christ through Noah and through Adam. That's why you cannot mythologize away Adam and why you cannot mythologize away Noah. Why you cannot get rid of fiat creationism, ex nihilo, that is, making creation out of nothing, which God did when he spoke his word. That's why you cannot allegorize away Adam and make him into some kind of an ascended ape. He must be the distinct creation of the hand of God on day six, a literal 24-hour day. That's why you cannot allegorize away Noah and his three sons and their wives, from whom all the tribes and nations of the earth sprang. We are all genetically related one to another, someplace back along the line as you get back toward Noah. And so Jesus Christ, because he is really human, he is truly human, is related to us because he's related to Noah and he's related to Adam when he took on real humanity through the virgin birth. Make that connection here in Acts chapter 17. This is why Paul's statement is so powerful here in Acts 17. He hath made of one blood all nations, for to dwell on all the face of the earth. You see, that puts us all under the same condemnation of the curse of the fall. And that puts us all under the same condemnation of the judgments that are yet to come by that man Christ Jesus, whom God had appointed to be the judge. And Jesus himself said, all judgment is given unto the Son. Because he's the Son of Man, because he's truly human, because he was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin, because he is also God, because he is perfect, because he has blood that did not corrupt, he saw no corruption when he was placed in the tomb, because he ascended after the resurrection and sits at the right hand of the Father, because someday he's coming to judge the earth. Scripture is a unit, folks. It ties together. The Bible is precisely what it claims to be. If it is not, then you and I have no hope. Because Christ came into the world to save sinners. Christ came into the world to redeem men and women and boys and girls. Those who are genetically related to Adam. Those who go back and were in the loins of Adam at the fall all of us sinned when Adam sinned. We're his extension. We're not the extension of some ape because animals can't sin. They're not moral creatures. We don't go back to the angels. They're not embodied beings. They're in a different realm and they're made differently than people. 
We fell through Adam. We didn't fall through Satan. We fell through Adam. Satan tempted Eve, and Eve gave the apple to Adam, and Adam ate it with his eyes wide open. But we fell in Adam. Do you understand why creation is so important? It's key to the issue that Paul is presenting on Mars Hill. He first talks about all of creation. He's made everything you can see, says Paul. But then he goes and pinpoints, he focuses on the creation of man. He's made of one blood, all nations, for to dwell on the face of the earth. That being said by a man who before his salvation would have considered himself and his bloodline to be the pure bl bloodline. But here he says, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same condition because we all go back to Adam. We all have one blood. Jesus is going to be the judge of those. We saw that judgment in Revelation, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, where God gives the earth increasing judgments of blood as we move from those seal judgments through the trumpet judgments and finally to the vials or the bowl judgments, which are the last. And so just like in the days of Moses, God gave them blood to drink, as he did with the Egyptians, so he will in the judgments in Revelation. He's going to give them blood to drink. And we saw this morning, if you allegorize Revelation, you must also allegorize the plagues of the Exodus. Because the same thing, God gave them blood to drink. In Exodus chapter 7, God will give them blood to drink as we move toward the end of the Great Tribulation period. You know, in preparing the message for tonight, I, I read a very fascinating article on human blood in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's a big, long, huge article and very technical. And I don't pretend to understand everything that's in there. I read about its composition, I read about its different blood types, I read about the components and what each component does. I read about how nowadays they can actually, when they draw a pint of blood from you, they can divide it into separate parts and use the different parts in five different people for different purposes as they give blood transfusions. That's fascinating. I read in there how there are things in human blood that are similar to certain animal blood, such as the RH factor, which comes from the rhesus monkey. But, of course, that doesn't prove we evolved from rhesus monkeys. It only proves that they're similar, just like they have hair and bones, but that doesn't prove evolution. It only proves a common creator. But the things that stood out to me as I was reading that article are human blood is distinct from animal blood. Remember that. God is made of one blood, all nations. Human blood is distinct from animal blood. In other words, you cannot give humans a pig blood transfusion. You cannot give humans an ostrich blood transfusion. You cannot give humans a sea slug blood transfusion. It's distinct from animal blood because men do not descend from animals. Men were created distinctly and individually on day six in the creation week. The second thing that clearly stood out in that article as I was reading it is all the different so-called races. People call them races. God says there's only one race. That's the human race. But the so-called races all have blood that is interchangeable and able to be transfused into other human beings. Now it comes in different types and there are problems that develop if you transfuse somebody who has one type with another type and different factors within that, but it is human blood and it can be transferred to other human beings. If you get a blood transfusion, you will not know who it came from. They don't tell you. You will not know if it was from a black woman. You will not know if it was from a Chinese man. You will not know if it was from an American Indian boy. You will not know if it was from a South African pygmy girl. You will not know if it was from an Eskimo grandmother. But all of those blood types are human blood. And they can all be given through transfusions into other human beings. Because God hath made of one blood all nations for to dwell on the face of the earth. One blood. That means that our blood, as Paul is making the point here, is very much up to date scientifically. Our blood points to the distinct creation of man 
in the image of God. And that's why murder is so wrong. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Not all killing of human beings is wrong, but murder is. And men are commanded to take the life of the murderer because he shed human blood because man was made in the image of God. Our blood points to the distinct creation of man in God's image. So tonight we've talked a little bit about how Paul points to the creation of man as the capstone of his argument and in the process he's made this very up-to-date scientific statement that was only discovered in our modern era. And again, just like in the first plague, blood points back to God as the creator and blood also points to the future where our Lord Jesus Christ who shed his blood for our sins has the right to judge the earth by giving them blood to drink. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had tonight to study the scriptures and to see how you trace this very important concept of the one blood of the human race back to Adam. And in doing so, it means that we must all stand under judgment for we are all descended from Adam. We are all born dead in trespasses and sins, Jews and Gentiles, no matter what nation on the earth that we are at, where we live, no matter what kind of blood type we have, it's human blood. It goes back to Adam. And because of that, because of our connection to Adam, because we're born dead in trespasses and sins, and we choose to sin because we have an old sin nature, someday the one who had blood that was incorruptible, the one who did not decay in the tomb, the one who had real human blood but had no human sin, someday that one will judge us and we need to be ready for judgment. Father, we pray that you'll take your word as it has gone forth tonight and that you use it for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we said at the beginning of the message,